morning. It's great to see you all here joining us together for our time of worship. You know, there's a great many things that are surprising and things that we have to look forward to. So let's continue to trust our God, um, continue to give Him praise, look forward to what He has in store for us in the upcoming uh, few months. Let's start off by worshiping Him. Let's give Him the praise that He deserves. So join us as we sing. afternoon, whatever it is you're watching this, let's take a few moments to make sure everyone feels loved. Let's continue to sing, let's continue to give God all the praise He deserves, so join us.
Now, you may have already heard the big news, and the big news is this, that the Gathering and Cornerstone Fellowship, two separate churches, are going to unite. We're going to merge to become one unified church. And in doing this, we are going to be a new church. And with becoming a new church, we are going to have a new name. These are very, very exciting times as we look forward to the future, as we see what God has in store for us together. I'm very excited, and I'm hoping that you are very excited as well. Now, as we move towards a merger, some of you may have questions about what the timeline will look like over the next several weeks. So let me just share with you a general timeline, and if you go to the gathering, you're going to receive more detailed emails, but... I just want to give a, a very, very general schedule of what's going to be happening over the next several weeks. Now, this weekend and next weekend, if you go to the gathering, we are going to meet in person. We're going to meet in person Saturday night at Mililani Baptist Church, right? So on the weekend of May the 8th and on the weekend of May 15th, the Saturday nights, we're going to meet 4 p.m. like we normally do at Mililani Baptist Church. May 15th, 4 p.m. at Milani Baptist Church. It's a Saturday night. That will be the final time that we as the gathering will meet in person just as the gathering. Now on Sunday, May the 23rd, we are going to join in with Cornerstone Fellowship. We're going to begin worshiping together. Worship services at Cornerstone start at 8.30 on Sunday mornings, 8.30 and 10 a.m. We're going to have two worship services, all right? So mark that on your calendar starting May the 23rd. That's a Sunday at 8.30 in the morning and 10 a.m. in the morning. And then on the first Sunday in June, June the 6th, I will be preaching as lead pastor of the gathering. Pastor Travis Laney, who has been serving as the interim lead pastor of Cornerstone Fellowship, he and his family are going to be flying back to Florida. And from that time, uh, we're going to move forward as a unified church. And I will take the reins as the lead pastor. But, but before uh, we get into today's message, I just want to let everyone know how deeply I appreciate Pastor Travis Laney, his wife Allison, and their family. Uh, we have built an incredible friendship with them. And it is really through the vision and the hard work of Pastor Travis that this merge is, is coming together. And so I personally want to thank Pastor Travis and his family for just their sacrifice over the last year and a half. Uh, they had no idea that all of this was going to happen, but they were very, very sensitive to the hand of God. 
And as they continue to seek the Lord, they believed in their hearts. Pastor Travis believed in his heart. He prayed about it with his wife, Allison. And as a family, they worked through this together. They believed with, with their hearts that this is where God was leading. And Pastor Travis was able to share that with the leadership of Cornerstone Fellowship. He shared that with me. And as a result, we worked through so much together over the last few months. And because of Pastor Travis's faithfulness, we see this becoming a reality. So I'm very thankful for Pastor Travis. I'm thankful for Cornerstone Fellowship. I am thankful for our church, the gathering. There's so much that all of us are going to sacrifice together. Whether you go to the gathering or Cornerstone, we're going to sacrifice together. However, the future is awesome. The future together is going to be incredible. Now, as we think about our future together with this newly formed merged church, you may have some questions that are floating around in your mind, in your heart. You're, you're, you're asking questions. But the biggest question that you may be asking is this. The question is, why? Why are we doing this? Well, I want to answer that question by giving three responses for why we are doing this, right? So let me share this with you. And the prayer is that you understand the heart of the merge, that you understand God's direction for the merge, and that we can come together in unity with one heart, with one mind, and one purpose as we come together as a church, all right? So why are we doing this? Number one, we're doing this because we are called by God to do this. Okay, we are called by God to do this. This is not something that we are entering into lightly. This is something that for me as a pastor, I had to pray through over the last three to four months. This is something that our elders and leaders had to pray through and, and look into all the details and just really see if this is where God was leading. And then as we look towards the future, we really needed to know, God, are you calling us to do this? And in the end, in the end, we are certain in our hearts that this is a direction that God is calling us to go. We did not make this decision lightly. Uh, we also didn't make this decision because the gathering needed a building. Now, I know that some people may start thinking, well, maybe, maybe the gathering decided to merge because the gathering needed a building. Let me share this from my heart. If God's hand was not in this, I would not have led. I would not have even proposed this idea to our leadership as well as our church. I know, I know that if God is not leading, that having a building is not worth it. I know that if God is not leading, that there is nothing that a building will offer that will offset, right? That will offset um, what, what God can do and will do apart from the building, you see, for me, and, and we, we have seen this over the last 14 years as a gathering, we didn't have a building, but we were able to build culture. We were able to love each other. We were able to do incredible work outside of the church. We were able to send mission teams overseas to Belarus, to India, to Japan. We have been able to raise up young people to enter into full-time ministry. We have impacted our community. We have impacted our island. And so it is not about the building. It is not about the building. The building was not a part of what we were thinking. It was all about God. It was all about God. I would never sacrifice what we have for the sake of a building. And so we are not joining together because we need a building. We're joining together because God has called us. God has called us to be together. We're also not doing this to take an easier path. The reality is one of the hardest things that churches can do is to merge. Merging together is not an easy path. We understood that. That is why it took a while for us to decide. This is why it, it really was important to all of us to seek God, to say, God, is this where you're leading? Because if it is, this is where we want to be. And we do believe that God is leading us into this merge. We know that there will be challenges as we merge together. However, 
the plan and the future that God has in store for all of us, both the gathering and Cornerstone Fellowship and as we merge together. Whatever God has in store for us, because we have been obedient to him, we know that God is inviting us to walk together with him and experience him in a very powerful way as we come together as a church body, as God uses us to reach our community, as God uses us to reach our island, as God uses us to reach the nations. I'm really excited about this, right? So it's not an, about an easier path. But it is simply about what God is doing. You see, as we were going through the pandemic, as we we're going through COVID-19, the big focus for me and, and our elders and our leaders was this. It was to get us through the pandemic. It was to get us through COVID-19. And our prayer was how God would be leading us forward out of the pandemic. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, as this merge became more and more real, right? And so we're still wrestling through, God, do you want us to do this? Is this, is this your plan? Is this your will? And, and you see, because in my mind, I'm thinking we are going to keep the vision for the gathering. We're going to continue to do what we're doing. We're going to work through this pandemic. And when it's done, God, we most likely may get back to the cafeteria and we're going to continue to do what we, we are doing. But as this merge became more and more apparent, it was about a month ago where I entered a time of deep wrestling, when I entered a time of deep questioning it and really seeking the Lord, God, do you really want us to do this? It, it, it was far easier for me to, to, to step out of this and this merge and say, God, we're just going to do the gathering thing. It, it would have been far easier to have done that. But as I sought the Lord, and as I cried out to God, it became very, very evident through the Word, through the Spirit of God, and through wise counsel from other people. And, and the more I began to pray and seek the Lord in this, there was no doubt that God was leading us, leading us as a church to merge with Cornerstone Fellowship. Now, on February the 27th of this past year, I preached the message from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, and the title of the message was Uncomfortable. This was really the first time that God used scripture to cause me to wrestle within my heart. And I titled the message Uncomfortable because these three verses made me very, very uncomfortable. Let me share this passage with you. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says this, now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Right? So, let, let's look at this passage. First of all... This story takes place in the church in Antioch. The church in Antioch was a growing church. The church in Antioch was becoming a headquarters for Christianity in, first, in the first century church. In fact, when you look back to Acts chapter 11, the Christians who were known as disciples, right? They're called disciples or followers of Jesus. They were first identified as Christians at the church in Antioch. That's how influential this church was. This was a happening church. God was moving in a very, very powerful way. And it could have been easy for leaders and people in the church to have become very, very comfortable with what God was doing. And in this church, it says in verse 1 that there were leaders, right? Prophets and teachers, they were leaders in the church. And at Acts chapter 13, verse 1 goes on to mention who they were. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, right? So they were leading together. They were enjoying the church. They were enjoying, all of them were enjoying their leadership. The leaders were enjoying being together. But then in verse 2, it says this, as they were worshiping, Okay, as they were worshiping, 
This simply means that as they were serving Jesus, as they were ministering to Jesus, as they were ministering to others, as they were proclaiming God as king, as they were worshiping God with their lives and with everything that they had, as they were worshiping God, and as they were fasting, right? As they were fasting. And so when, when we hear fasting, they were going without food, but they were also praying. They were seeking God. So they were worshiping with their lives and they were seeking God with their hearts, their attention, their affections were pointed to God. It says this, as they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, right? This was the call right here. This was a call. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And I can remember wrestling through that because as we think about the gathering, as we think about what God has been doing and what God is doing, even during the pandemic, there have been some awesome things that God has been doing. And as I think about our people, as I think about our future, I, I was so excited. I was so excited. I, I love our leaders. I love our people. I love the way things are. But as I continue to seek the Lord, as our leaders continue to seek the Lord, it was apparent that God was calling us to do something different that would cause us to be uncomfortable. That, that we need to respond to God and our response to God in, in, in moving forward would cause us to be uncomfortable. I can remember, I can remember because this was about the time when, when the possibility of this merge first came. And I can remember crying, I can remember weeping. I can remember just imagining what life would be like without the gathering as we knew it in the past. There was a brokenness that went on inside of me and I was becoming uncomfortable even thinking about the possibility of merging, but the Holy Spirit was doing a work in me. And as we began to pray about this as elders in our own church, the Holy Spirit began to work on our hearts as well. And then in verse 3, it says this, And after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, right? So um, you're, you're here's, here's what was happening. Here's what was happening. So as they were fasting and praying and worshiping, the Holy Spirit spoke to the leadership of the church in Antioch. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul from this leadership team and send them out. Now, you can imagine how uncomfortable that would have made the leaders at that time. You had your leadership team, you're comfortable with this leadership team, you see strengths in each other, you see how these leaders could help you and, and help to, to move the gospel forward in Antioch, and now they're asked to go and to go on this mission for God outside of this leadership team and outside of the church, I can imagine that this made Paul and Barnabas uncomfortable. This probably also made the leadership team uncomfortable. And when the church in Antioch caught word of this, this probably made the church in Antioch uncomfortable as well. But here's the thing. They were all willing to follow the call of God. No matter what the cost, they were willing to follow the call of God. And then, so this is, where, this is where verse three comes in. After they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they set them off. They responded to what God was calling them to do. So during this time, a few months ago, as I wrestled through this passage, this passage caused me to wrestle. It, it really did. Wrestle with my own heart. Um, this caused me to seek God. But as I did that, it just showed me that God had bigger plans for, for us as a church, bigger plans for us as, as we merge together with Cornerstone Fellowship. And, and as I wrestled, God just in, encouraged me towards this merge. You see, I, there was one day when I journaled in my journal. I wrote this in my journal. I said, it is when we are taken from what is comfortable that is when God does his greatest work in and through us. It is when we are taken from what is comfortable. That is when God does his greatest work in and through us. This is where I had to begin releasing my own heart and my own attitude and my own wants to, to the Lord. And I began to say, Lord God, whatever you want, whatever you want, this is what we're going to do. 
And so as a result of that, I, I, I stand before you, church, to say that beyond the shadow of a doubt, I believe that God is leading us into this merge. And I'm very excited. I'm excited, most of all, because we are walking into something that God has invited us to be a part of. Number two, why are we doing this? We are doing this because we are being given a great opportunity. We are being given a great opportunity. You see, both churches will be able to do more together than we can on our own, right? So you have the gathering and you have Cornerstone. God has incredible plans for both churches. But now as we think about what God is calling us to do, and there, God, God is purposeful. God is intentional. God is sovereign. And when God calls us to do something, he invites us to be part of his plan. And as we sought God and as we prayed to God, it is very evident that as a church, as a unified church, the Gathering and Cornerstone Fellowship, we're going to be able to do more together than each church doing whatever we do on our own. You see, God, God has given both churches people, right? He's given us great people. He's given, he's given the gathering awesome people. He's given Cornerstone Fellowship awesome people. And when we come together, when we come together as one church, I'm so excited about the opportunity to build family, to build fellowship. And as for those from the gathering, you know what that fellowship is like. You know what that, that family is like. We get to do that together. And we get to, to build this ohana. We get to do this as a church body, uh, as a gathering. But now we're going to join in with Cornerstone Fellowship. And we are going to be one church. We're going to be this merged church. We're going to build family. We're going to love each other. We're going to love each other. We are going to use our spiritual gifts and our talents for the glory of God. We're going to multiply what God has already blessed us with. And as we come together, we're going to have resources that will allow us to continue to further the gospel in our community, to further the gospel around the island, to further the gospel to the ends of the earth. I, we, we need to be excited about that. And, and, and so as we come together and we're praying that God, through Jesus, and as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, would create an incredible synergy amongst us that will help us spread the gospel even more effectively. And then there are facilities, right? There's a, there's a facility, uh, the Cornerstone Fellowship facility. And as we look at this facility, it's not just for Sundays. It's not just for Sundays. But this facility... And God willing will allow us to, to train and to raise up leaders, will allow us to bring pastors and churches together. Uh, this facility will, will, God willing, allow us to host conferences and reach our community with seminars and, and what it means to, to walk with Jesus, what it means to live the Christian life. Uh, we can teach theology. We, there's so much that we can do with this facility. This facility will also, as we train people, as we raise people up, will be a tool, will be a tool used by God to help us send people out into the community, out throughout our island, and reach the ends of the earth. We want to be able to leverage every single resource. We have been given a great opportunity. Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 says this. Jesus said this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We have been commanded by Jesus himself to go out and to make disciples of all nations. And when Jesus says baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he's talking about literally immersing people in water. And when, that, when we do that, right, because people have given their lives to Jesus as an outward expression of this inner reality, people are baptized. And when people are baptized, what they're saying outwardly is this, I'm identifying with God. I'm identifying with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus says, go out, 
teach people what it means to follow Jesus, teach people about salvation, lead people into, in, into having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and, and have people identify with Jesus. And then in verse 20, he says, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Right, Jesus says, teach people to observe everything that Jesus has commanded us. What better opportunity than coming together, leveraging our resources for the glory of God. In Acts 1.8, Jesus told his disciples this. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, when we are in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are going to be Jesus' witnesses. We are going to proclaim Jesus with our mouth. We're going to proclaim Jesus with our actions. We're going to lead people into knowing about Jesus, knowing who he is. We're going to share the gospel. But this is possible through Christ. This is possible because we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And as we are obedient to Christ, we can see that with this church ohana that we have, this merged church, that God will use us. God will use us as we're given this great opportunity to spread the gospel in our community, throughout the island, and among the nations. Number three, number three, why are we doing this? We are entering a new season. We are entering a new season. Both the gathering and Cornerstone Fellowship, we are entering a new season. You see, COVID-19, as we look back in the life of the gathering, and as we have looked back to, to our journey for over a year now, we can see how God has used something that could have destroyed our church. We have seen how God has used COVID-19 to change our hearts, to change our affections, to, to give us greater determination, uh, to, to think of new things and, and maybe even new ways of of partnering together and doing ministry in ways that we probably would not have thought of had it not been for COVID-19. I don't know if this merge would have been possible without COVID-19. I believe that God was taking us into an incredible season. I don't know if you remember us as a church coming out of 2019, moving into 2020 before COVID-19. We were headed for some exciting times and we were looking forward to the future. But through COVID-19, God has caused us to, to wrestle, to think, to pray, to seek him. And as a result of that, as a result of that, he has presented us with this opportunity. And as we look at this opportunity, we're seeing that the hardship and the challenges of COVID-19 has really brought about a new season, a new season in the life of the gathering and a new season in the life of Cornerstone fellowship. On April the 11th, just a few weeks ago, I preached a message from Luke chapter 5. And in that passage, I read Luke chapter 5 verses 36 through 38. And it says this, he, talking about Jesus, also told them a parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And so here's what's happening. You see, usually um, when you have a new patch or a new piece of cloth, that cloth has not shrunk yet. And so what, what will happen is this. The old garment will be set in its ways. It, it, ha it, has, it has already shrunk. It will, it's, it's, it will be the way it is. And so when you put on a new patch on an old garment, the new patch will shrink. And as it shrinks, it'll pull and it'll actually tear the old garment. And that is why Jesus, right? Jesus is saying no one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. That's unthinkable. You don't, you don't do that. And he says, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. It, it just does not match. And then the parable goes on to say this, right? Jesus says, and no one puts new wine into old wine skin. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. It will spill and the skins will be ruined. No new wine is put into fresh wine skins. Okay, so here's what, what's happening. When you have 
a, a new a new wine skin. You can put wine in there, and and as the as a new wine ferments in the new wine skin, the new wine skin will will stretch, right? The new wine skin will stretch. Now it is unthinkable to put new wine into old wine skin because the old wine skin is the way it's gonna be. It's set. And you put new wine into old wine skin, the old wine skin as as the as the wine, as the new wine ferments and as it bubbles, it'll it'll stretch the old wine skin. And eventually the old wine skin with a new wine is gonna burst. Here's what Jesus is saying here in this parable. He's saying that you do not use the patch. You don't you don't go to Jesus as a patch to to fix your old ways or the old ways that we do things or the old ways of understanding him. We also don't pour new wine into the old wine skin, right? It's a, an, another example of of just pouring something where we're just set in in who we are and not focused on Jesus. You see, what Jesus is saying is this, when we follow him, we follow him with a new heart. We follow him knowing that he is in control, where we surrender all of who we are to Jesus. We give our affections, we give our attitudes, we give all of who we are to him. We say, Jesus, make me new, make me new. And then when he makes us new, no longer, no longer is Jesus simply a patch to what we do. It's about the whole garment. It's about putting on the whole garment, putting on something entirely new. When it's about the new wine, it's no longer about putting new wine into old wine skin, but it's about putting new wine into new wine skin. In other words, it's it's about being made new in Christ. It's all about following Jesus and being made new in him, in and through Jesus. And you see, this is a new season. This is a new season for all of us. This new season is not possible because we're excited. This new season is not possible because we want to rah-rah our way through this transition. This new season is possible through Christ and Christ alone. And as we seek Jesus, we're going to ask all of you, every one of us, to, to seek Jesus, to renew our minds, to renew our hearts, to renew all of who we are, so that as we move forward into the future, that it will all be about Jesus. It will all be about what God is doing. It will all be about what the Holy Spirit does as he moves in and amongst us so that it can be about new wine into new wineskin. This is a new season. As we go forward, as we move forward in this merge, here's what I would like to see us become as a unified church. This is the culture that I'm praying we form as we come together. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. The Apostle Paul writes this. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, right? So he's writing to Christians. He's writing to the Christians in the church in Colossae, but we can make application to our lives right now. We are chosen by God. God has chosen us. We are saved by grace, by God's grace, right? Through Christ and Christ alone, by our faith in Christ and Christ alone. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, okay? So Paul is about to mention how God sees us. God sees us as holy and dearly loved, right? So we're chosen by God and God sees us as holy and dearly loved. God loves us. God sees us as righteous and perfect, not because of our actions, but because of who we are in Christ, Paul writes this, he says, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, bearing with one another. In other words, restraining ourselves from giving a negative reaction when times are hard. But it's trusting Jesus to allow us to show love to each other, to be kind to each other, to be compassionate to each other. We bear with one another. And forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another, right? So it's about being able to forgive. We love each other because God loves us. We show compassion and kindness and gentleness to towards each other. We also restrain ourselves, 
We restrain ourselves from, if, if somebody irritates us or uh, if somebody does something that, that we don't like, that, that we look to Jesus first. We trust the power of the Holy Spirit to, to, tr- to, to go about addressing issues, not in our flesh, but through Christ as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then it talks about forgiveness. That's going to be super important. Right? And, and right now, maybe in your life, there are people in your life who have hurt you and you haven't forgiven them. Maybe you need to forgive them. Maybe trust Jesus to give you the strength to forgive people in your life who you have yet to forgive. You see, as we understand the forgiveness of God through his son, Jesus Christ, is when we, we understand the forgiveness that we as followers of Jesus have been granted uh, through Christ, and, and because of the forgiveness of God through Jesus, we no longer are going to suffer the wrath of God for eternity. We're no longer going to be separated from God. We're going to spend eternity with God. We're going to be experiencing his inheritance and everything that he has to offer. When we understand that kind of forgiveness and when we live in that kind of forgiveness, we're going to be able to give that forgiveness away because we have been living in that forgiveness. And so as followers of Jesus, as we come together as one church, we need to be able to forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you are also to forgive. Verse 14, it says this, above all, put on love. The word for love in this context is agape love. This kind of love is selfless love. It's sacrificial love. This is God's love. This is love for God. This is God's love to us. Uh, and because we, we're experiencing God's love in our hearts and in our lives, we're going to love God back in response to his love for us. But the overflow will be that we're going to love other people. We're going to be able to give that love away. And so Paul is saying, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You want to be unified? We want to be unified. We all want to be unified, right? What's well, loving God. And as we love God, We are going to love each other. We're going to sacrifice for each other. We're going to serve each other. We're going to be selfless towards each other. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ, let the shalom, let the shalom of Jesus, right? Let the shalom of Jesus. What does that mean? Let the harmony, the tranquility, and and the idea of being made complete, shalom. Let that kind of peace come through Jesus, right? And when we have this kind of shalom, we have peace with God and we have peace with each other because we have peace within our own hearts because we have peace with God. It says, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful, right? It's this peace that comes from God that will unite us. And then verse 16, it says this, Let the word of Christ, in other words, let the gospel of Jesus, let the word of God, let scripture, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom teaching. Wisdom teaching, that's wisdom that comes from God and admonishing or warning one another through songs. So these are songs from the Old Testament, songs that come from scripture, songs that come from the book of Psalms through psalms or hymns, right? These are songs that give God praise and honor and thanksgiving and spiritual songs. These are songs that are directed to God, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. In other words, we'll give thanks to God, right? As we are together as one church. And then in verse 17, it says this, and whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, We're going to do everything under the authority of Jesus, according to the will of God through Jesus. And we're going to depend on God through his son, Jesus Christ. We're going to see the Holy Spirit moving in a very powerful way. And then we can give thanks to God, the Father, through Jesus. So this is what's going to happen amongst us. We're going to love each other. We're going to build relationships with each other. We're going to build family. We're going to build ohana. We are going to think the best of each other. And with what God does in and amongst us, as God is building this fellowship, as God is building this church, there are going to be people who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They're going to see the love that we have for each other. Not our activities. I mean, our activities are good to draw people in, but ultimately it is about what God is doing. 
And the ultimate sign of what God is doing is the love that we have for God and amongst each other because the Holy Spirit is moving. That becomes what draws people into the fellowship and towards Christ. You see, love is a gift of the Spirit, a fruit of the Spirit. Love. We love God. We love others because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in us through our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We're going to love each other. We're going to sacrifice for each other. We're going to grow together. And we're going to build this new church on Jesus. We're going to build this church on, on, on loving God through, through Jesus Christ. We're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see God do a work in and through us as we're reaching out to each other, loving each other, serving each other, sacrificing for each other. But it doesn't stop there. And I just want to read a few passages from Scripture that really speak to the end goal of what we're doing. You see, the end goal for this merged church is not to have a happy fellowship where we love each other and it stops there. We are doing this because there's a greater purpose for us. And the greater purpose for us is to express the glory of God in our community, to express and share the glory of God, to spread the gospel throughout the island, to, to express God's glory and, and the gospel uh, in, around our island, in our community, and amongst the nations. This is why we do what we do. It doesn't stop at the church. It doesn't stop on the church property, but it spreads in our community. It spreads to the island. It spreads amongst the nations. Let me read uh, just a few more verses and then we'll be done. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 1 says this. You nations, come here and listen. You peoples, pay attention. Let the earth and all that fills it hear the word and all that comes from it. Right. So all the nations, all the peoples, all ethnic groups, all cultures must hear about the glory of God. And as God's working in and through us, we become that vehicle to be obedient to God, to spread the gospel, to spread the glory of God to the ends of the earth. Psalm chapter 66, verses one through five. It says this, let the whole earth shout joyfully to God. Sing about the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. The whole earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name, Selah. Verse 5, come and see the wonders of God. His acts for humanity are awe-inspiring. This is, this is why we exist, because we know God so deeply. We know him personally. And as we're growing in our relationship with God personally, we have a church family who we can grow with and who we can pour into and others are pouring into us. And as we do that, we say, well, God, I'm growing in you. I'm growing in my relationship with you and I'm growing in my relationship with you through Jesus. I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit personally, but we have this church family. This church family is helping me to grow. But as I grow, I know I can't keep it here. We need to be obedient to take this gospel, to spread your glory to the ends of the earth. And we can do that effectively as a unified church. That is my prayer. That should be our prayer. Let us pray that God leads us to do all that he desires to do. Let us pray that as we walk in obedience to God, that, that our minds and our hearts will be blown away because of God's faithfulness, because of our obedience to God's call, because we have surrendered we have surrendered to the direction that God has for us, right? Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you so much for today. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to gather together like this to worship you. Lord God, you have given us a tremendous call, not just for myself, but for our entire church. And you have given Cornerstone Fellowship this, in, this incredible call to come together, to merge as one church to be a church that will be unified, to be a church that, that reflects Jesus, to be a church that pours into each other because we love you and because we love each other. God, we pray that, that, that this will be a church, that, that as you're moving, that we will be obedient to take the gospel to our neighborhood, to take the gospel to the island, to take the gospel to the nations. Father, we are hungry for you. We thirst for you. And God, we are excited about what you are doing. But God, we surrender ourselves to you. 
Lord God, you are so awesome. We thank, we praise you for being a mighty God, for being a powerful God. We lift up all these things in Jesus' name. We just heard uh, an amazing message. Let's let it soak to our hearts and affect the way that we worship and the way that we live. So let's continue. Let's continue with our worship.